Good afternoon. I am Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Chief Operating Officer of the Holocaust Center for Humanity. I'm speaking to you today from beautiful Seattle, Washington, the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples. I want to thank the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany for supporting our Lunch and Learn programs. And thank you to all of you for tuning in today. I know for some of you, this might be the first time you are joining the Holocaust Center's programming. Welcome. And for some of you, you are regulars. Have you visited the Holocaust Center for Humanity in Seattle? If so, we'd love to know. Please feel free to let us know in the chat. The Holocaust Center does extraordinary outreach work with schools across the state of Washington. We also have a museum in downtown Seattle that is open to the public on Sundays and hosts school field trips and special events throughout the week. The Holocaust Center maintains an archive of over 8,400 items, including more than 2,700 photographs. These items come from Holocaust survivors, eyewitnesses, U.S. liberators, and Army personnel, all with a connection to Washington State. You will have the opportunity to view some of the photos from the archive in a special temporary exhibit starting this Sunday. The exhibit is entitled Memories Unboxed, Rare Photos from Our Archive, and the exhibit will be on display starting this Sunday through Sunday, May 28th. This unique selection of photos highlights the humanity of individuals and reshapes our understanding of the Holocaust. I'm putting a link in the chat where you can reserve your, reserve your tickets to come and visit. It is March and we are commemorating Women's History Month. If there's a woman in your life who influenced you, please share this person's name in the chat so that we can recognize the many outstanding women in our lives and in our history. Today, we will explore the ways in which women were impacted by the Holocaust, both as victims and as survivors. We will look at the specific challenges that women faced during this time and the gender stereotypes with which they had to contend. We will also highlight the important role that women played in resistance movements, as well as the efforts made by women to care for and protect their families and communities in the face of unimaginable hardship. By shedding light on the experiences of women during the Holocaust, we hope to deepen our understanding of this history and pay tribute to the resilience and strength of the countless women who endured it. We are privileged to have author Sarah Silberstein Swartz with us today, who has dedicated her latest research and book to honoring remarkable women. Her recent book, Heroines, Rescuers, Rabbis, Spies, Un Unsung Women of the Holocaust, profiles nine ordinary women who took extraordinary measures to save lives during the Holocaust. Sarah is the daughter of Jewish Polish Holocaust survivors and was born in post-war Berlin, Germany. She is a writer, translator, and an award-winning book editor who specializes in Jewish women's studies and Holocaust history and literature for young adults, general readers, and scholars. Her work has been published internationally in Canada, the United States, Germany, and Poland. Sarah is currently a research associate at the Hadassah Brandeis Institute at Brandeis University. And she lives in Boston where she's joining us from today with her wife and cat and near her beloved three grandsons. Sarah will take questions from the audience at the end of the program. Please type your questions at any time into the Q&A option on Zoom. Sarah, I'm so honored to have this opportunity to speak to you today. I'm wondering if would you start us off by telling us what inspired you to write your latest book? And as the daughter of Holocaust survivors, can you tell us about your family history, which influenced this book? I see myself, the daughter of Holocaust survivors as the linchpin between generations. Since the surviving witnesses are almost all gone, the transmission of Holocaust stories to the next generation is now my responsibility. 
I'm beginning to feel that my own experience as a daughter of survivors and a child immigrant to the US is part of this history. I was born in Berlin, Germany in 1947, two years after the end of the war. My parents were Jewish Polish refugees who had lost almost all members of their families in Poland, their parents, their aunts and uncles, their cousins, their husband and wife, and in the case of my father, two young children, his children, Rivka at age 12 and Moisha at age eight, were deported from the Warsaw Ghetto to the Majdanek death camp in Lublin, Poland, where they were murdered by the Nazis. An only child, I consider them the brother and sister I never had. I never knew my grandparents. Before the war, my mother and father lived in a Polish shtetl, a town called Visegrad on the Vistula River, 35 miles west of the capital city of Warsaw. Over half of Visegrad's inhabitants were Jews who lived a relatively peaceful life amongst their Christian Polish neighbors before the Nazis invaded Poland in September 1939. My parents, who were neighbors and family friends, became in-laws when my father married a young woman also from Visegrad, and my mother married her younger brother. When the Nazis occupied their town, they fled to join the larger Jewish community in Warsaw. Before the Holocaust, Warsaw had the largest Jewish population in Europe, second only to New York City. In Warsaw, the Nazis eventually imprisoned all the Jews in a ghetto, a small area enclosed by a steep wall topped by barbed wire. There, 360,000 Jews, almost one third of the city's entire population, were confined in just over one square mile. Nazi soldiers guarded the gates. When Jews deported from the West were forced into the overcrowded ghetto, food and resources became scarce. Many people died of starvation and disease. Others were shot on the ghetto streets. Soon others were rounded up and deported to concentration camps where they were murdered. In 1943, a band of young, Jewish, of young Jews staged an armed rebellion called the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. In retaliation, the Nazis burned down the ghetto and the remaining Jews were deported to the death camps of Treblinka and Majdanek. My father and his two children were sent by freight car to Majdanek. At the gates of the death camp, they were separated according to their usefulness and my father was unable to save his children. A flower merchant by trade, he pretended to be a technical draftsman. The Nazis assigned him to draw blueprints for bomber aircraft parts. From Majdanek, my father was sent as a prisoner to several other concentration camps. Altogether, five concentration camps in two years. Toward the end of his internment, his assignment became shoveling excrement for the Nazis. My mother and her sister escaped the burning ghetto through the sewer tunnels of Warsaw to the Christian Aryan side of the city. My mother went into hiding while my aunt stayed above ground, passing as a Catholic Pole. My parents were lucky to survive the Holocaust. When the war ended, they found each other in Warsaw. Knowing that their spouses were no longer alive, they married and made their way to occupied Berlin, where they were safe under the Allied troops. By November 1947, when I was born, they had made a new life for themselves in Berlin. Meanwhile, they still waited for visas to enter the United States as refugees. By November 1951, my parents and I, at age four, became American immigrants living on a chicken farm in Connecticut.
Sarah, these are just remarkable stories of your parents, really remarkable. You, you've written your latest book for a younger audience, even though the stories of the Holocaust are so difficult. What do you hope teens and younger audiences will take away from this book? And what message do you hope they will hear? Well, people often ask me why I write a book about heroines of the Holocaust for young adults today. Why is this history currently relevant to young people and why stories specifically about women? Today, young people live in a world rife with authoritarian populism, racism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, and bigotry against immigrants and refugees. And yes, there's still plenty of sexism and misogyny. Until very recently, not enough stories of women's strength and resistance during the, during the Holocaust have been told. In 1932, Hitler came into power through a democratic vote by despondent, angry people who felt they had been wronged, blaming their grievances on others. It is now over 90 years later and extreme nationalism, white supremacy and violence keeps repeating itself based on ignorance, fear of being replaced and hate of outsiders. Given that the Holocaust was a unique event, its lessons remain universal and timeless. My message. Understanding history informs my perspective, and I believe empathy is teachable. From a young age, children need to learn and understand events from the past in order to develop their own moral compass and take ethical action as young adults. It is critical to educate young people about the lessons of the Holocaust so that they can make worthy choices in the future. My goal in writing this book is to inspire young, my young re readers to rise by example to the historical moment in their own lives, to stand up for themselves, to become activists for their own ethical causes, to help the less fortunate, and to do whatever they can to care for the world in which we all live. Sarah, we work with many teens and young adults at the Holocaust Center, and I'm really excited to share this new book with them. I, they are a passionate, motivated group, this new generation, and I think this book will be of great interest to them. There are many remarkable women in the history of the Holocaust. How did you choose the ones to include for this book? In my book, Heroines, Rescuers, Rabbis, Spies, rather than focusing on statistics or chronological history lessons, I present the brief, accessible bi biographies of nine brave, resilient women and their indiv individual lives before and during the Holocaust. The idea behind my book began with my mother, Regina Zlotnik Zilberstein, and my aunt, Ruth Zlotnik Altman, the sister survivors in my book. I wanted to retell their stories, but I didn't have many facts about their Holocaust years. I knew so little about their wartime experiences. They rarely spoke about them, though these experiences followed them and shaped their lives and mine too. A lot of interviewing and research followed years after their deaths. With my mother's and my aunt's spirits, Perched on my shoulders, I wanted to convey the lives of other women who lived courageously in the Holocaust years and thereafter. As I looked for women to write about, there were many unsung heroines to choose from. I finally selected seven other women from varied backgrounds and different geographic locations in Europe. All but one, Rabbi Regina Jonas, the first ever female rabbi ordained in the turbulence of 1935 Berlin and murdered in Auschwitz were survivors. 
How did I choose these individual women? Some had special meaning in my own life. Years ago, I was fortunate to work as a ghostwriter for survivor Faye Shulman, whose book, A Partisan's Memoir, describes her life as a Jewish member of a Soviet partisan brigade in the woods of Belarus. She was a young professional photographer who became a nurse and a partisan fighter, all the while taking photographs to document her wartime experiences. I tell two stories of non-Jewish women who risked their own lives to rescue Jews. As a child, I knew rescuer Irina Gut Updike as a family friend who accompanied my aunt when she visited us on our chicken farm in Connecticut. Irina, a Christian Pole, made the daring decision to hide Jews in the cellar of the house of her employer, a Nazi Wehrmacht major, forced to work as a waitress and laundry supervisor in a munition factory compound in Tarnopol, Ukraine, she befriended the Jews under her supervision and hid them just before they were to be deported to their deaths. Thanks to her intervention, 17 rescued Jews survived the war. I chose survivor Lena Kishler Silberman because of the altruistic choices she made after the Holocaust, which entailed caring for 100 Jewish orphans. During the Holocaust, 1.5 million Jewish children were murdered. Having lost her own daughter to starvation in the Lvov ghetto, she took it upon herself to provide for surviving Jewish youngsters after the war, all traumatized, malnourished, and left without families. A surrogate mother to them, she established a children's home, first in Zakopane in the summer of 1945, a resort in the Tatra Mountains in Poland. When, anti when the anti-Semitism surrounding them became intolerable, she smuggled her 100 children, aged three to 15, into France. Finally, in 1948, she brought them to a kibbutz in Israel where they finally had a future. Each story in and of itself is has so many layers to it. And Sarah, I'm not sure if you know this, but Irene Opdyke's daughter lives in Washington State and has come to our center occasionally to, to speak for us. And we have um, a panel that profiles Irene in our museum as well. Just a really incredible story. And for those of you listening, if you are interested in learning more about Irene, her memoir, um, in my hands is just definitely worth the read. Sarah, March is Women's History Month, and these women were outstanding not only for their actions, but also because of the challenges they faced as women. Can you tell us more about this? Well, to answer your, your question, I'm going to read an excerpt from my book about about Rabbi Regina Jonas, which exposes the challenges faced by these heroines and their legacies. Rabbi Jonas was a unique spiritual leader, born in Berlin like me, who rose above male dominance and Nazi terror with great courage and tenacity and received almost no recognition after her death. When Sally Preissen was ordained in 1972 by the reform movement in the United States, she was incorrectly celebrated as the first female rabbi in the world. In fact, it was almost 40 years earlier, on December 27, 1935, that Regina Jonas was ordained in Berlin, Germany, just as Nazi persecution of the Jewish people was accelerating. Though she was highly educated and immensely talented as an interpreter of Jewish customs, history, and law, Regina Jonas struggled to receive ordination as a rabbi within her own community. 
She graduated from the Hochschule für die Wissenschaft des Judentums, Germany's liberal rabbinic, rabbinical seminary specializing in teaching students to interpret and argue Jewish texts. The topic of her graduation thesis was, can women serve as rabbis, in which she argued that nothing legally, Jewish legally, stands against women holding rabbinic office. Still, she was denied ordination because she was a woman, instead graduating in 1930 with a teaching certificate. For five years, she taught religion and continued her rabbinic studies until she finally received private ordination from the Association of Liberal Rabbis. Despite her new title, Berlin's Jewish male leadership did not allow her to lead services or to preach from the synagogue pulpit. Until after Kristallnacht, the pogrom of November 1938, after which hundreds of rabbis fled Germany or were imprisoned. As the male rabbis fled, Rabbi Jonas was finally asked to lead services at established synagogues in Berlin. Gender conventions were suddenly dropped during these dire circumstances. Many advised Rabbi Jonas to leave Nazi Germany while she could but she rejected the idea of leaving her people behind. Her decision to stay in Berlin to support the remaining Jews became her ultimate defiant act of resistance and leadership. In November, 1942, Rabbi Jonas was arrested for being a Jew and deported to Theresienstadt where she gave sermons and lectures and offered comfort to fellow prisoners. In October 1944, she was transferred to Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp where she was murdered. After the Holocaust, none of her surviving male colleagues from the Berlin Jewish community of the 1930s and 1940s ever mentioned her ordination, her achievements, or even her name. This included the notable Berlin rabbi, Leo Beck, liberal spokesman for German Jewry and a fellow prisoner with her in Theresienstadt. Not only had he been one of her teachers, but he had signed a German translation of her Hebrew rabbinical diploma just before he was deported. Why then, after he survived the Holocaust and she did not, did he fail to tell the world about her? In Theresienstadt, Rabbi Jonas had worked closely with Viktor Frankl, a prominent Jewish Viennese psychiatrist who survived the Holocaust and later became well known in the United States and all over the world. Working together in Theresienstadt's so called Department of Health and Hygiene, they greeted together the newly arrived Jewish prisoners at the train station and helped them adjust to their new grueling lives. Though Frankel often spoke about his own experiences in Theresienstadt, he never mentioned Rabbi Jonas or her leadership role in their two years as fellow prisoners. Like Rabbi Leo Beck, he failed to refer to her achievements and the importance of her leadership in, Ber in Berlin and Theresienstadt. Nor did he mention her legacy as the first woman rabbi. It took more than 50 years for the world to find Rabbi Regina Jonas again. In 1942, when Rabbi Jonas realized she would soon face de deportation, she placed 14 files of documents with the Berlin Jewish community for safekeeping. Her collection of documents were passed on to the Central Archive of German Jewry controlled by the Nazis, where they were kept to document what the Nazis expected would become the vanished Jewish race in Europe. After the war, Soviet 
officials transferred these documents to an obscure archive near Dresden in communist East Germany. Only after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the reunification of Germany were these documents recovered. In 1991, a feminist scholar doing research on German women who sought ordination in the 1930s discovered an envelope containing a document in German and Hebrew with Regina Jonas's name on a teaching certificate and searched for more. Later, Jonas's entire collection of documents were transferred to the newly formed collective archive of German Jews in now United Berlin. It took until 2004 for Jonas's historical leadership to be internationally recognized with the publication in English of a biography, Fräulein Rabina Jonas, the story of the first woman rabbi. Today, there are well over a thousand female rabbis who represent Jewish communities around the world. With each one, Rabbi Jonas's legacy continues. In Rabbi Jonas's own words, for me, it was never about being the first woman rabbi. I wish I had been the hundred thousand. I want to, Sarah, I want to mention a comment that came up in the chat from Clarice who wrote, it's so wrong that Rabbi Jonas was not recognized by some very important men, and yet she made a huge difference and should have been recognized. I'm so, we're so grateful that you helped to bring her story to light in this book. Of the women you wrote about um, in this book, was there one that particularly stood out to you? Well, they were all that all of them stood out to me. Um, but um, while editing an English language volume of the Ringelblum archive, I developed a deep affinity for heroine Rachel Auerbach, a prolific writer who wrote about her and others' experiences before and during the Holocaust. In her writings, she intimately described the brutal life in the Warsaw Ghetto as my mother and my aunt must have experienced it. The communal soup kitchen, which she ran in the ghetto for starving Jews, was on the same street where my mother lived. Like my mother and my aunt, she later escaped to the Aryan side of Warsaw as the ghetto was set on fire by the Nazis. Unlike my mother and my aunt, who rarely spoke about the Holocaust, Auerbach believed in the importance of personal storytelling. Before the war, she wrote about the plight of Jewish women in interwar Poland and what it meant to be marginalized as a Jew and as a woman. During the war and for the rest of her life, she bore witness to the atrocities of the Nazi regime. She was only one of three survivors of a group called Oinig Shabbos. It was organized during the war by historian Emanuel Ringelblum to collect thousands of documents, the Ringelblum archive, during the final days of Jewish life in Poland. In 1946, thanks to Arabas' persistence, part of the Ringelblum archive was discovered in 19, was discovered under the rubble of what had been the, the Warsaw Ghetto documenting historic proof of the genocide of Eastern European Jews by the Nazis. Yad Vashem, developing and heading the department for the collection of witness testimony, her mission became to collect eyewitness testimonies from Holocaust survivors, as well as to document evidence for those who did not survive. By 1965, Auerbach had collected 3,000 testimonies in 15 languages. Visiting Israel, my parents contributed to her collection of testimonies at Yad Vashem with the details of the lives and deaths of their own deceased loved ones, my own missing family members.
To conclude, I will now give a brief excerpt from my book, The Story of My Mother and My Aunt, two very ordinary women who acted with great courage during and after the Holocaust. Sister survivors, Ruth and Regina Zlotnik. At the end of my book, I tell the story of Ruth Slotnik Olkman and Regina Slotnik Silberstein, two very ordinary women, sisters who survived the Holocaust together by adopting false identities. Each sister had a role in the other's survival. During the Holocaust, courageous Ruth worked as a courier for the Jewish resistance in Warsaw. Resourceful Regina had the money for bribes with which to pay for food and shelter. They were saved by the audacious bravery of Ruth, who pretended to be a good Christian Pole with a cross in her purse. She befriended and made connections with Christian Poles, smuggled food, and found hiding places on the Polish Aryan side outside the Warsaw Ghetto. Their survival was aided by the ingenuity of Regina, who covered gold coins and fabric and sewed them into the lining of her coat to be used for bribes. While over 300,000 Warsaw Jews died of starvation and disease or were deported to death camps, these two sisters managed to survive in Nazi-occupied Warsaw. Ruth lived dangerously above ground in Warsaw throughout the entire war with her false papers as a Christian Pole. Regina lived hidden in Warsaw until the Polish Warsaw Uprising in September 1944, when she was captured by the Nazis, ironically as a Pole, and sent to Moiswitz, a forced labor subcamp of Buchenwald by Auschwitz and Ravensbrück. Extreme times can make heroines of ordinary people. Ruth and Regina Zlotnik, my aunt and my mother, represent the many ordinary Jewish women survivors who are unsung heroines. If not for their harrowing experiences after the Nazi invasion, they might have been young women living conventional lives in the country of their birth. Both Slotnik sisters had the courage, the resilience, and the luck to remain alive under horrific circumstances. In addition to their resistance during the war years, it was their unflinching determination to carry on with their lives after the Holocaust atrocities that made them heroines. Ruth and Regina were determined to live fully after the war to make up for all their suffering and losses. Using their well-honed survival skills and their natural inclinations, the two sisters embodied the co continuation of life after the Holocaust. Many women survivors state, stated that their greatest achievement was bearing healthy children after their physical and emotional deprivations and tortures during the Holocaust. Regina gave birth to her first and only child, me, when she was over 40 years of age, much older than most new mothers of her generation. Having escaped the brutality of the Holocaust, she bore a child out of her belief in the future. In, incredible, in really incredible stories. Um, Sarah, there's a question that came in here from Marcy who asks, I can't wait to read your book. Thank you so much. What is your perspective of why women have so often been trivialized and erased from history, including of course, these significant stories of the Holocaust? And why have the narratives been so male focused for so long? Thank you for reviving the powerful leadership of these women so that we can all keep learning. 
Well, thank you. I think that is a more or less a rhetorical question. Um, I'm not sure. It's a much big, bigger issue than women, unsung women of the Holocaust. I mean, this is um, uh, this is uh, the society we live in um, and have lived in for a long, long time. Um, I um, I think it's really important for us always to look for the uh, the women's stories and to pass these on to future generations in the hope that um, uh, these unsung women um, will be recognized. There's a there's another comment and question here um, from Helena who asks. Thank you for your moving presentation. You have three young grandsons. Do you speak to them of your family's Holocaust history? And if yes, how and what do you choose to tell them? Well, there is this big question of when do you start to talk about the Holocaust um, to young children? Um, and I think that is a very individual choice that um, parents make. Um, I think that if one's own story um, uh, is a Holocaust story, then um, you're more likely to uh, present that to young children, to your own young children. Uh, my grandsons are um, three, six, and seven uh, years of age, so they're pretty young. Um, and I talk about my parents quite often. Um, I talk about um, uh, the war, the Holocaust. Um, and what I find with the three-year-old, it is definitely too, uh, too early. But um, for six and seven-year-olds, it's quite interesting because it depends very much on the personality of the children. Um, I have um, my uh, seven-year-old Reuben is very interested in knowing more about the war. Um, he um, uh, is interested in wars in general, much to our chagrin. Um, but there's something about these stories that really interest him. And he asks me questions and I answer um, as I can. Um, my other grandchild um, is not ready, not as ready. And though he's interested in family stories, um, I'm waiting for him to ask me more questions. And Sarah, do you remember how you learned about your parents' experiences during the Holocaust? How did, how did they tell you? How did you know? Well, um, I always feel that I was kind of born knowing, but of course that's not true. Um, my parents didn't specifically talk about the um, their experiences. My mother talked a lot about my father's experiences and also about his two, ch two children who were killed in the Holocaust. Um, but I think most of all, I grew up, my, um, my parents were immigrants, um, their, uh, there wasn't much family, uh, so their friends became family. And we lived in a community of survivors, um, or we, you know, we sat around a table with survivor, other survivors, and they talked. And being an only child, I listened. Um, so I don't think that I directly heard stories from my parents. Um, until I was older and even then they were fragmented. Um, but I was always surrounded by these stories. You, you talked a little bit about your, your mom and your aunt after the war. Can you tell us a little bit more about what their lives were like and, and even after the Holocaust? I know they didn't speak about it very much, but how, how did they live their lives? Well, my mother and my aunt were very different uh, right from the beginning. Um, my aunt um, uh, was um, 
uh, much more bold and um, uh, she was also a very, very talented uh, uh, seamstress. Um, she never had any children, so I was the one that um, both my mother and my aunt and the you know few survivors uh, paid attention to. Uh, my aunt um, was unusual in that she was the breadwinner. Uh, she became um, a high fashion uh, clothes designer uh, in Manhattan. Um, and my mother was a very ordinary um, uh, housewife who um, uh, I, um, in many ways, it was my aunt who was my role model. Um, and it's only recently, um, very much in creating this book, that I realize um, that my mother was a heroine in her own right. Hmm. Um, and in her own way. Hmm. Um, there's a, another question that comes here and it's from Paul and he is wondering, is there a teacher guide that goes along with your latest book? And if not, are there any plans to create one? Well, um, uh, I will take that up with my publisher. Uh, <laughs> so far, this book uh, came out in October and it has received really nice reviews um, uh, so far. And we're hoping that it has, you know, it has educational, it does have educational significance. And perhaps my publisher will be um, open to uh, creating a, a, a teacher's guide for it. Uh, but it's just in the beginnings of, um, its life as a book. Well, if there's one created, be sure to let us know. We'd love, we'd love to see it and use it. Um, there's a another question here, um, and this person asks, "I am, oops, excuse me, I am, I am very moved by you saying that you believe empathy is teachable. Do you have any stories about this, or could you tell us more?" Well, I'm not sure I have a story about it, but I have a great belief in it. And, um, you know, there is the, you know, the um, hope that um, when young people hear these stories, uh, they will feel empathy for the individuals that they are reading about and that this will go further. Um, I. Um, you know, how does one create empathy rather than anger? I mean, that's a, also a very difficult, almost rhetorical question. Um, but in writing this book, uh, it was very definitely my goal to um, uh, narrate the stories of these women uh, that young people could, could relate to and feel um, empathetic and inspiration from. Sarah, so what I'm I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about if you have any projects in the works now or what you're what you're currently researching and involved in or editing. Well, that is um, a good question. Um, I have been working on my memoir for um, I'm embarrassed to say probably uh, eight years or more. Um, and I'm still, I'm trying to finish that manuscript. There is something about writing a memoir that, um, uh, that where time just goes by. Um, and in the midst of this, um, I was asked by my publisher to uh, put this book, uh, Heroines, Rescuers, Rabbi Spies, together um, in a year's time. So I managed to do um, this book in one year, and I am hoping to complete my memoir in um, in the next year or so. I can't wait to see your memoir. With all of the research and <laughs> stories that you have been entrenched in, I, I can't wait to see your memoir. Well, I, I hope you'll be able to <laughs> very soon. So 
Sarah, aside from the book, is there um, is there a message or something you would like? What would you like our audience to to know or to walk away with from from all of these stories and from all the work you've done? Well, um, you know, as I said in the beginning of my talk, um, we live in such a precarious time. Um, the echoes um, of the Holocaust are right here. And um, it's very important to look at the past in order to understand the present. Um, and I sincerely hope that um, these lessons from the Holocaust will will make a big difference for future generations, uh, for the young people um, who are growing up now. Um, and that really is, you know, my goal in putting this book together. Um, I, um, I'm a great believer in telling in storytelling, as I've mentioned, and I think that that is what makes um, uh, you know makes history accessible. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I feel like the the stories are what make it real and human. And exactly, um, and I you know I particularly feel that. Um, uh, as we lose our survivors and witnesses. Um, and I guess in my mind, I like to think of um, my book providing readers um, these stories and that they too, they too will become witnesses of a, of a kind. Um, mm -hmm. I never went through the Holocaust. I've lived a very privileged life uh, in North America. Um, but I do really feel the importance of uh, telling these stories uh, now that um, the past generation is gone and to pass it on to the new generations. Mm -hmm. Well, Sarah, it has been such an honor to have you with us here today and to tell us about your book and these stories and your own family's history and your own personal history. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Well, it's been my pleasure and um, you've been a great hostess. <laughs> I, it's been wonderful and I, I hope we have many more opportunities to talk and collaborate. Thank you very much. Thank you and thank you so much to all of you for joining this program today. One of the biggest compliments you can give us is to share this program with a friend, a colleague, or a family member. You can send them a link to the recorded program, which we will have up on our website by tomorrow, or invite them to join a future program on a Tuesday. When you share the program, it helps other people to find the Holocaust Center and to hear these great speakers. Please join us for our next Lunch and Learn program, which is going to be in one month on Tuesday, April 4th. It will be in commemoration of Genocide Awareness Month, and we will be ho hosting the inspirational Gabrielle Boldang, who is one of the Sudanese Lost Boys and founder of the nonprofit Hope for Aryang Foundation, which provides access to quality education in South Sudan. Our Lunch and Learn programs are possible because of all of you, and because we have a fantastic team at the Holocaust Center. Thank you to Richard Green, our Museum and Technology Director, who is running the behind the scenes of this program. And a huge thank you to our CEO, Dee Simon, and to our entire team, Lori Warshall cohen Paul Regelbrug, Jessica Michaels, Morgan Romero, Amanda Davis, Devon Shire-Lockey, Katie Lawrence, Brenda Anderson, Anna Morris, Demetrius Spinrad, and Lexi Jason. Thank you again for joining today's program. We hope to see you all at our next Lunch and Learn program on April 4th. This concludes our program for today. <laughs>